Hello, I'm Jesus Labarta, and this video will present an introduction to tables in Parader. It is a continuation of a previous video on the timelines, and what I have actually here is I have already loaded the same trace and same timelines that uh, we use there. And our interest now is how to, to show how to go from timelines like this one, for example, of MPI call to tables that uh, essentially represent profile or histogram information. I did it by selecting the table, the timeline, sorry, and clicking on this button, the third button, which is about creating a new histogram, new table. In it, uh, we have a table with as many rows as the original uh, timeline. Let me color the columns. We have as many columns as possible values we have in the original table, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the original timeline. So essentially, this was a timeline of MPI calls. So we have here uh, one column per MPI call. We see that this is, for example, MPI I send, MPI I receive. We have uh, uh, entries in the tables where there is nothing, for example, on the bar and broadcast, barrier, and, and this other one, which has no symbolic information. These uh, have no, no actual values in the trace. There's nowhere in the trace where these functions appear. And actually, we can pro probably hide the empty columns and get only the ones where we have values. We can really see some curious things. For example, there are some threads, some processes do not do any call to MPA receive, while some others do. Even if that's not very apparent on the, on the timeline, the table does a quantitative absolute uh, statistics on, on what is going on, what's happening, what, what every thread was, was actually doing. In reality, the statistic here, the value here, is uh, one of many possible choices. We can come here to select the choices. We can look at the statistics and the statistics we have now selected time. So the value here is time. Time that this thread, for example, thread nine, has spent in this column, in MPI I receive. And it has spent 12.26 milliseconds. This is the aggregate time over all of the instances, all of the instances, all of the times this function, this thread entered this function. We could change the statistic, and sorry, by the way, you see that the coloring is the classical parallel gradient of light green representing low values, in this case, 100, 700 microseconds, dark blue meaning large values, in this case, 31 milliseconds. What I wanted to say is that the statistic can be time, but there is a wide range of possible statistics. For example, we can represent uh, not the absolute time, but the percentage of the window time, of the elapsed time of the window. And the coloring has not changed much because the gradient is essentially the same. But if you look at it, the value is now different. What it says is this thread has spent in MPI I send 4.34% of its time. This is a standard, typical, traditional profile information on a per thread per process basis. We can represent other statistics. We can represent number of ports, number of instances, number of times this happens. And here, if you go to it, this is the number. This thread does 545 ISENs, same number as I receives. For example, all reduces only one. OK. So, we can we have a wide range of statistics. Let me look at some other one. For example, average burst time, the average duration of those. So we are calling uh, about 400 times I send and I receive. But how long is each of them in average? In this case, is 20 microseconds in the order of 20 something microseconds. There is uh, this MPI all reduced. There is takes more time for the threads at the bottom here 
in the order of 2.3 milliseconds. In reality, we could do a very wide range of statistics. I want to show you one, for example, average value of, and the average value is the average value of, of another metric. And in the case of uh, this other metric, well, of course, as you have it now, is the average value of the MPI calls. And the average value of the MPI call is the MPI call ID itself. This is only telling us that MPI I send is uses the, ID, the identifier number three and and already uses the identifier number 10. So this is not a very useful view, but you might want to do the average value of the MIPS. And this is giving, giving us the number of the MIPS achieved during the execution of the MPI calls on average. So the way it all achieves a good number of MIPS, probably not very useful because probably it's a busy weight loop, but uh, it's a good number. Maybe this, this I sense and I receive are doing something more useful, and but maybe not such a good locality, maybe. So the thing is we can measure statistics which are average, so not just a standard profile in terms of total time, but the average of any other metric and in reality is any other metric that we may have. If we had a metric which would tell us the message sizes, we could report the average of the message sizes. If we had a metric that would say the cache misses, we could tell the average of cache misses in inside the, these uh, MPI calls. So what I want to insist is on the mechanism is, is a, a statistic which is computed whenever that thread is inside that uh, value in the original control window. By the way, given a table, you can always pop up the control window by clicking here on the left, the window that determines the columns, and this is the MPI call. And the statistics that you can do is a very, very wide, very flexible range of statistics. The other thing I wanted to show you is we have seen that how to go from, uh, from one um, timeline to a table. How can we go? What are the options of going from a table to a timeline? And we have this uh, fifth button, this open filter control window, which allows us to select a region of the histogram. And the tool will automatically generate a window which only has that specific semantic value. For example, if, I, if I'm curious of saying when in the timeline are all these MPI receives that my table tells me they are there, but I cannot see them. So I have clicked on this, on this uh, red button, I select the region, and the system will generate a table where all, only for the threads that do have um, this call, and where we will see the call. And you see that it actually happens kind of everywhere, right? But only on these threads. I can actually use, and we have seen this with the timelines, maybe if I clone this and I, if I take it out of the, and if I copy and paste the, the objects, I can see all the now all the MPI calls done by the threads that call MPI receive, or I can do the reverse and I can look at the copy and paste the default to here, and I can see only the MPI uh, receive calls in all threads that, as we said, is only executed by the threads at the bottom. So this is a very very uh, powerful mechanism to find needles in haystacks. Also, is to select regions that the histogram of the table tells us they are there. We don't see them. It's a way of finding them, finding them. Let me get rid of these two windows. One final question about the histogram. It was automatically tuned to the different, to set the different values that appear as called many columns as the different values that appear here. It by default, when you start up, it actually escapes the uh, the value zero because here there are MPI calls but there are regions with value zero, semantic value zero. If we want to also get the statistics about semantic value zero about the computation and that might 
be often be very even more relevant than doing the statistics for for MPI. Uh, what I just want to show is that you can control of this table, this table you can control what is the minimum value of the column, so I can put value zero. This is the maximum value of the column and this is the delta. Because we are with categorical values, the values are integer numbers, so the delta is every column is only one 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 integer one number. We'll see later for histograms how this can be used for real value metrics. But what I've done here is I've also included the column of value zero. The column of value zero is when there are zeros here. It's the column that corresponds to outside MPI. And we can do the same things we had before. We can do what we have set it up now was to represent the average value of the MIPS. And on average, we get uh, 1,600 MIPS. But I could represent the percentage of time, and this is on 85% of the time. You can really see the numerical values, clicking on this uh, histogram zoom. You see the numerical values, you see for all of them the numerical values, and actually at the end you have some averages that tell on average 86% of the threads are, are computing. This is the overall efficiency of the of the execution. Well this was the profile of the of the MPI calls. We can do the same thing for the MIPS. For example I take the MIP, I create with clicking on this new histogram I create a histogram And this histogram was set, was set up to represent from 5, which is the 5.26 microseconds, which is, sorry, MIPS, which is the smallest value that appears in the trace, to 7200, which is the largest value. So this is from the minimum to the largest, to the maximum value, and this is the bin, the bin width. For example, if I use here a 100, it will go on, oops, I did one, sorry, 100. In bins of 100 MIPS, I have less bins now, okay? But this goes, the, the very first column actually corresponds to when I am between 5 and 100, and maybe this is not very, so maybe it would be better to look between 0 in, in, in increments of 100. Between 0 and 100 MIPS, between 100 and 200, and, and the statistic is again the same thing. The total time I spend in phases that have those MIPS, the total number of times that this thing happens, or the average duration when these things happen. Okay, the statistics you can represent and let's let's clone it. Let's clone it. I have again same window let me do it let me do it with a little bit more precision let me use just 10 MIPS let me copy the control scale the control scale is this this uh, this histogram range and, and width and let me change in one of, I have the average uh, burst time. I'm not interested in the average burst time. I'm interested in one of them, for example, in the percentage of time here. And in the other one, I may be interested in, rather than the average burst time, I may be interested in the um, average of MIPS, for example. So I have to this is a histogram of MIPS. The average of MIPS, it's clear that is really, uh, so it's, it's, it's a, a linear gradient. Here I am very much to the left and I have very few MIPS. I'm very much to the right, very many MIPS. But it's, it's, it's actually the range and the average value is the same because I'm computing the average of MIPS. But I could compute the average of something else. And do I have here something interesting here, maybe of useful duration? And this is actually saying 
what the color represents, what was the useful duration, how long was the interval when I had this, this many, this many MIPS. So both of them are, and, and in this case, for example, well, I don't have a, two metrics with very different value. Maybe let me look at in some of the previous configurations that I have used, maybe look at some configurations that have to do with cache misses. The, the, what I want to say is that I can try to correlate here to make correlations. What, this is a histogram of MIPS. What would be the average value for this histogram of MIPS? What would be the average value of cache misses? The color now represents whenever I go those many mis, uh, MIPS, so the more to the right, the more MIPS I got, what was the cash miss ratio? And there is some rational in the sense that very good MIPS, very much to the right in this MIPS histogram, low value of cash misses, so it's, it's what we would all expect. When I get poorer misses, poor MIPS, higher cash miss ratios. This is what I would expect. Well, probably I have another one region here, which is a little bit strange, where I have not very good, in reality, bad MIPS, very bad MIPS, and I have not that bad cash misses. Again, as happened with uh, with the histograms when we saw for to, to how, how to go from the table of MPI calls to the specific MPI calls, we can do the same thing for histograms with any metric. For example, this is a histogram of uh, MIPS. I'm interested in finding out, so I clicked here in this open filter control window, finding out where in the timeline happen those regions here that have bad MIPS and have not that bad L3 cash misses. And they happen, and I, you can see where they happen. They seem to happen in this intensive communication uh, communication structure. Essentially, nevertheless, the objective of the of the session was to show how you can really navigate with timelines to histograms, uh, to, from histograms to timelines. Overall, if you had a histogram of useful duration, a useful duration window, for example, so let me get rid of these other things. Then let me get rid of these histograms and timelines. And I'm interested in useful duration. I would be interested in building the histogram of useful duration. This is the histogram I have of the different computations of, of this of these regions. So essentially, this long thing probably, cor probably corresponds to that one. If, if I want to find out the same idea as always, I select this region. And yes, it corresponds to that. If I fix the, controls, the, the color in the scale, yes, at the bottom, there are some threads at the bottom that have, that are a little bit shorter. You see this, this thing here, where does that happen in the timeline? It happens here. What does it mean? It means that for some reason in this region, these first processes take more time than the other ones, but they are in the same in the same time interval. So you can really navigate and try to understand loading balances. You can try to understand the the actual distribution of durations. If you had a timeline of instructions, the histogram of instructions would also relate to to load imbalances, you can really navigate in understanding the distribution and the behavior of uh, metrics with very fine, very fine precision. So uh, before closing, just let me see that uh, these uh, statistics, you can apply them to any, any kind of metric if you have, and I have actually prepared in the same directory, I have prepared other views. If 
for example, I can load the with this multispectral multiscalar uh, multispectral metrics scalar metrics of of Paraver. I can load this configuration file, which is well. First, it's telling me there are some of the events that are required for the configuration file that that not on the trace, and this is an important thing. If your trace doesn't have a certain hardware counter, for example, this one has not L2 cache misses. If you try to load the trace file, a configuration file that exposes L2 cache misses views, it will be not be possible. You can see, for example, duration of computations, MIPS, IPC, instructions per cycle, L1 cache misses per thousand instructions, L3 cache misses per thousand instructions. These are views about the scalar behavior of, of the uh, computations. Of all of those, you can do histograms. Of all of those, you can go from the histograms to the timeline. Other views. You can do views having to do with MPI. This one we have already seen, but you can have a view of, for example, communication size, message sizes of the calls. Of course, from this one, you can build a histogram, and this histogram will tell you what are the message sizes that are being used in the, in the program. We see there are regions with small message sizes, so probably in the histogram these are somewhere around here. We see there are regions with larger message sizes above the, the, the threshold that we have here in the, in the coloring. So these probably are some of those. We see that they are not the same for all the processes. So this is a histogram of the sizes of the MPI call messages. One interesting thing is that I might be interested in having not only the histogram of message sizes, but I might be interested in differentiating on a per MPI call basis. So would it be possible to do a histogram of sizes for ISENs, a histogram of sizes for weights, a sizes for receives? So actually this tables mechanism that we have has a kind of what we call a third dimension. So the possibility of specifying yet another timeline, which will be used to discriminate between different planes. And in this case, I'm going to do one plane per MPI call. So I'm going to have, in reality, here, one plane per MPI call. And I will be able to choose the plane that is being displayed. This is the plane for MPI receives. So this is the MPI size, the message sizes for MPI receives. This is the plane for ISENs. This is how large are the ISEN messages. And you see that vertical lines. Vertical lines means that in the histograms, everybody has the spikes at the same bin in the same message size. So all the MPI size ISENs are of the same size. If we look at the weights, it happens that the weightals don't have these vertical lines. There are some processes that receive more message, more data. This is the message size, receive more data than others. If all the sends are of the same size and the receptions are of different size, it certainly means that there are uh, every process has a different number of neighbors or receives from different number of uh, of uh, communicate other processes. Anyhow, this gives you the possibility of looking, for example, at, at message sizes or at any histogram categorized or selected by a, a third, what we call control window dimension. Well, I had uh, a timeline here, uh, this one about message sizes, but you can do another, ti another timeline with uh, durations of the MPI calls. And if you have uh, durations of MPI, uh, you have sizes and you have durations, you have effective bandwidths, bytes per second or per microsecond or whatever it is. You have this effective bandwidth and you see that in this region, for example, the message sizes are small. The effective bandwidth that is achieved is small. This is on a per thread basis. 
you can finally aggregate this information in the vertical dimension and you can have the instantaneous aggregated bandwidth that you get through the execution of the program. Well, in reality, bandwidth, there are kind of a couple of different ways of measuring it. One of them is bandwidth from, from endpoint to endpoint, and the other is bandwidth, let's say, local view of bandwidth. What is the size and the, and the duration of the call from the local point of view? This is with the local point of view. This is with the end send so um, endpoint bandwidth but but essentially the message here would be you see that there's a very low aggregated bandwidth across adding the bandwidth of across all threads there are some spikes but there are long regions with not that much of bandwidth being used and finally we have another window here which is actually is actually saying to who I am sending. You can think of that. So this is for every communication, the window, the semantic function of time of this thread. So let me make sure it's not synchronized. The semantic function of, let me zoom. The function of time for, for this thread is saying to whom am I sending? If I zoom, this is actually saying that at this point in time, I'm sending to neighbor, I'm for, uh, for 14, I'm sending to myself, to myself, sorry, to 16, to three, to 27. So this is to whom I am sending. This is yet another of the possible functions of time that the system generates. And doing tables, built out of this function you can build the typical connectivity patterns that of course Paraver can also be directly in some other ways but what I was trying to show is the huge power of this combination of timelines and tables in one of them you represent the evolution along time in the other you get rid of the time dimension and you present the the actual values of the function with this I I'm going to complete this session on the uh, tables and histograms. If uh, you are interested and you want to get some more description on the actual way of computing this huge bar flexibility variability of functions of time, I will be doing that in a different, another video. Thank you very much for your attention.